remember being real embarrassed because like you're with your mom. You know you want to do it, but but the whole process of, you know, you're standing in this lingerie department or this teen, teen department looking around and thinking, you know, I hope nobody sees me here. The term puberty refers to the set of physical changes that occur at the start of adolescence. The changes are part of the program of the biological clock, which governs our physical development throughout life. During puberty, sex hormones are released into the bloodstream at very high levels. Eventually, the hormones create young men and women biologically ready to reproduce. This program is about the changes that make up puberty. We're going to see how they differ for boys and girls, and we're going to probe the mystery of their origins in the biological clock. But we're also going to look at the meaning of these changes to adolescents today. What do you think of yourself when you're the first in your class to wear a bra, or one of the last to grow tall and develop a beard? And what do you do if your body becomes an object of ridicule? How our bodies turn out at puberty has a profound effect on our self-image. Around the age of nine in girls and ten in boys, puberty begins mysteriously in the depths of sleep. Something in the brain stimulates a master gland located at the base of the skull to release hormones that affect the ovaries in girls and the testes in boys. In response, the ovaries or testes release sex hormones, and a year or so later we see the first outward signs of sexual maturation. What it is that originally triggers this domino effect is unknown. It says if the whole system is sitting there waiting for some signal which is associated with sleep, this is Dr. Inez Batens, a pediatric endocrinologist. I can look in the laboratory at a pattern and I can tell you when the nurse marked down that the boy fell asleep just from the hormone level. Not only are these hormones released during sleep, they are released in pulses. Pulsation is important because the body cannot tolerate a steady stream of hormones. If there is too much traffic, the master gland, called the pituitary, shuts down. Dr. Batens. The pituitary gland is not able to tolerate a continuous presentation of this hormone. It's a self-protecting mechanism so that if you're presented with a stimulus continually or past the maximum tolerable uh, level that instead of over-functioning and blowing up the cell, it just doesn't respond anymore. As puberty goes on, this pattern of nighttime pulsation will change and extend into the day, and it will set off a string of biological changes leading to reproductive maturity. The sequence of the changes is predetermined by the biological clock. In girls, it goes like this. First, breast buds and pubic hair, then a growth spurt in which fat is deposited on hips and buttocks, then the first menstrual period, and finally, ovulation, the release of the first egg. Now the girl is fertile. What's remarkable about this sequence is that fertility comes so late in it. A girl's first ovulation normally comes a year or more after her first menstrual period. In boys, the normal sequence of events at puberty is nearly the reverse. First, the sex organs grow larger and pubic hair appears. Then comes the first ejaculation of semen, then the growth spurt, and finally, a lowering of the voice and the appearance of facial hair. What's remarkable about this sequence is that fertility seems to come so early in it. The time of fertility uh, in boys has been more difficult to document because one really needs to not only have semen, but uh, viable, fertilizable sperm. And so it appears that it's about the same age uh, that the ejaculate occurs, but of course whether the sperm is really mature enough to be ready to fertilize an ovum has not been studied and is not known. On the average, girls start the sequence of puberty a year or so earlier than boys, but the best estimate now is that both sexes become fertile at about the same time. Though the sequence of biologically evented puberty is constant, there is a great deal of variation in when the sequence begins. Today, any time between 8 and 16 is considered normal. Many different factors contribute to when a particular individual comes of age. There are some genetic predispositions. Some people from the southern climates, Mediterranean areas and so on, will have familial patterns which predispose them to be earlier than late. 
and there are other individuals where in the family tree there are quite a few individuals who are late developers. In this century, we are coming of age earlier and earlier. In 1900, the average woman in the United States experienced her first menstrual period around the age of 16. Today, as a result of changes in nutrition and living conditions, it's 12 and a half. Because the average age is now holding constant, it appears to represent the lower limit of the biological clock. But even though the age at which puberty begins has changed, the sequence of biological events that make it up has not. And therein lies a puzzle. Why does fertility come so late in the sequence for girls, and why so early for boys? Piecing together the history of the biological clock requires imagination and a tremendous attention to detail. There are clues in bones and stones, clues in genetic material, clues among the great apes, clues among those few humans who still roam their habitats as our distant ancestors did. Finding the clues and putting them together would boggle the mind of a Sherlock Holmes. But unlike Mr. Holmes, we'll never know for sure who done it or what done it. Why does the biological clock have fertility come so late in the pubertal sequence for girls? One possible answer is that social pressures affect the timing of the clock. Take the development of the breast, for example. The development of the breast is strange in the sense that um, it's the first step in puberty is the development of a breast bud. Jane Lancaster, professor of anthropology. When we look at non-human primates, breasts don't develop until um, the last part of, of pregnancy and they are strictly glandular. Uh, that is, they don't represent uh, fat deposits. They represent uh, the glands that are used for milk production. And when a female primate is not nursing, uh, those breasts disappear and she just has little nipples. With humans, it's different, and the difference points to social needs. The breast is usually uh, quite well developed before fertility is actually established. So it looks as if it might be a kind of social signal and it may be a way of um, advertising uh, reproduction long before fertility is established. In the time before human beings covered so much of their bodies with clothes, visible breasts were an outward sign of sexual maturity. Along with fat on the hips and buttocks, they made girls look like women even though they weren't fertile. That was critical, according to Barry Bogan, an anthropologist. Our evolutionary past shaped all of this. It was vitally important for girls in the past to look like women but not be able to have babies. You see, if they looked like women, they would be considered more like women by adults. That is, they would begin to be able to do things that adult women do. If we think of our ancestors of a million years ago as dating and courting, which I'm sure they did in their own way, the, these girls who look like women but are not capable of having babies were learning how to successfully interact with other adult men and women. Then, after they've practiced these adult skills, which includes all the social life and also sexual life of adults, then they're actually ready to have babies. They've learned what it takes. Okay, it, it helps socially. But how could something that helps socially be so important and so critical in the ongoing development of a human that it would actually get coded into the timing program of the biological clock? Because the individuals that possess this kind of growth pattern for, for girls, that is, looking like women, before they're actually fertile, meant that they would end up having more babies and rearing more of those babies to adulthood. That's the way evolution works. And the fact that girls start to look like women before they are really fertile conveyed some advantage to them. Exactly. And to the human life course. They were better spouses, they were better mothers, they were better lovers, they were better 
at doing all the things that adult women had to do. In boys, the sequence of events at puberty follows the opposite pattern. Fertility comes early in the sequence when they still look like boys. They do not develop stature, muscles, facial hair, and a deep voice, the signs of manhood, until later. In the past, becoming a man too soon may have been dangerous. Boys learn to be men best when they are fertile but still look like boys. And the reason is probably pretty simple. If boys started to look like men before they were fertile, they would be perceived as competitors by the older men, their own fathers, their older brothers, and other men in the social group. Any of the men out there will remember this probably from their own youth, that long before they looked like men, they were interested in what was going on, they wanted to participate, but they were perceived as wimps still, and not as serious competitors. But that's precisely the way it should be for boys to best learn their adult social roles. We will never be sure how the events of puberty came to be scheduled by the biological clock, but there is little doubt that in the 20th century, the clock is out of evolutionary context. As we're about to see, the meaning today of girls looking like women and boys looking like men is very different from what it was for our ancestors. <laughs> I was short and pudgy, and that you know, as opposed to now, growing up, you kind of f develop and fill out. But I remember being short and pudgy, kind of going, "Ooh, I feel like a little, you know, a little, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it, but just a little, little guy sitting in the corner that's not really fully developed." In the United States today, puberty begins any time from eight to sixteen years of age. Many children anxiously await the signs of puberty as they notice physical changes in their peers. But what happens when you're the first or the last kid on the block to start to look different? Ironically, the answer today appears to be different from what it was for most of human history. Professor Lawrence Steinberg. The answer seems to be that, that early maturation is much, much easier for boys to manage than it is for girls. In fact, not only is it easier for boys, it seems to be an advantage, at least in the short term, because early maturing boys, most studies show, are esteemed by their peers, are given more uh, roles of responsibility, and have a greater degree of popularity and self-confidence and higher self-esteem than late maturing boys do. Early maturing boys are the first to catch up physically with girls, who normally begin puberty a year or so sooner. Early maturation gives boys other advantages as well. Professor Steinberg. For boys, early maturation makes them uh, better at athletics and sports. And in adolescence in America, um, athletics and sports is still the ticket to popularity for boys in most junior and, and senior high schools. And so it makes sense that going through puberty early would give those boys an advantage. Physically, I didn't fully develop until probably my senior year or later in high school. And that was probably what hurt me more than anything. And being able to play, I mean, my coordination was pretty much there, but it develops more as you, you develop, or develop physically. Boys who mature late are at a double disadvantage. Less competitive at sports, they may also suffer problems with self-image. Well, the late maturing boy is often in a very difficult situation because he is small, smaller than his peers, and not only smaller than other boys, but because girls mature faster than boys. A late maturing boy is smaller than everybody. And it, it, during adolescence, one of the things you don't want to do is stand out from the crowd in a way that's not admirable. And being small and slight and not able to compete in sports the same way that early maturing boys can do is a real disadvantage for the late maturing boy. Fortunately, the situation is only temporary. Eventually, late maturing boys do catch up. Going through puberty almost always has a positive impact on the young boy's body image. So the boys who suffer body image problems at adolescence are likely to be late maturing boys who have not yet gone through puberty. But since uh, in our culture, growing taller and getting more muscular is a good thing, um, every boy gets to have a chance to have his body image improved at puberty. For girls, the situation is reversed. 
the first to reach puberty tend to have difficulties. Looking like a woman when you're young does not mean what it did in the distant past. Early maturation for girls is associated with, in many studies, diminished self-esteem and increased involvement in problem activity and problem behavior like drugs and drinking and early sexual activity. One of the things we think that may be going on for girls is that early maturing girls are drawn into an older peer group because of their more adult-like physical appearance, and that older peer group may introduce them to activities um, and interests that otherwise would have been delayed in their onset. A girl who matures early may be very critical of the way her body looks. Well, what was it like to be the first girl who needed a bra? Um, I didn't like it. Well, because what would happen was, I guess, I became kind of hunchback because I, I kind of hit it. I didn't, I, I guess I didn't like it. The ideal body shape today for a young woman, at least as it's held out by um, various media, is to have small breasts and to be tall and leggy. And that coincides with the appearance of a late maturing adolescent girl. Long legs, blue eyes, blonde hair, uh, small waist, big boobs. And probably in California, they like the long hair look. How do you stack up against this list? Um, I'm too short. <laughs> I don't have the long legs. <laughs> don't have blonde hair. I have long hair. I have dark eyes. And I'm not exactly skinny. An early maturing girl is deviating from the, the romanticized, idealized body type, and therefore that may uh, uh, put her at somewhat of a disadvantage in terms of how she feels about herself. And the odds of ending up with the ideal body are slim. Unlike boys, girls who suffer from a poor body image do not have an immediate solution. I think that for girls, Growing during adolescence is more of a kind of a crapshoot. You, you really don't know. Some girls become heavier and end up with large breasts and large hips, and some girls stay kind of thin and end up with long limbs and small breasts and small hips. So I think the bottom line is that for some girls, they grow into the culturally idealized body type, but many girls do not. Steinberg believes much can be done to help adolescents develop a good body image. One thing is preparation. Children who are aware of the physical changes at puberty seem to handle them better. And so I would imagine that parents who do a good job of educating their uh, sons and daughters about what is about to happen to them, how it's going to make them feel, what changes are temporary and which ones are permanent, that those kids are not going to suffer problems in their body image at puberty even if their body doesn't turn out to be an ideal type. More important, we can put physical appearance in proper perspective. One of the most important things that teenagers can do for each other and that parents can do for teenagers and that educators can do for teenagers is to diminish the importance of the body as the source of self-esteem. That's the fundamental problem, really, um, that, that we do pay too much attention to people's physical appearance and not enough attention to other skills and talents that, that young people have. I thought about having breast deduction surgery for about, oh, I'd say three, maybe four years before I actually had it done. I knew I was thinking about it when I was in high school. Um, I can remember telling someone at one specific point that I was thinking about it. This is a 19-year-old we'll call Beth. Recently, she had breast reduction surgery. She was someone for whom the so-called crapshoot of puberty brought physical discomfort and social ridicule. She was someone who took dramatic action, but kept her perspective. Beth's story is unusual, but the feelings she describes are not. Beth matured a little later than her peers, but by the time she was a junior in high school, 
she had already had painful experiences. There was a guy, a class above me, he was graduating senior, and they had left senior wills. And every senior got a copy, and they posted one for the rest of the school to see. And um, he left me a periscope so I could see my feet. And that, I knew the guy. I didn't mind that so much as the fact that afterwards, people I didn't even know came up and commented on the periscope and my needing one. And to know that your breasts were kind of the joke of the school was not easy. Another experience came when she was a senior. I had a friend who was a sophomore, so I'd walk down sophomore hall all the time when I was a senior. And every time I walked by this group of, group of guys, one of them would say, in a voice just loud enough so that I heard, and he knew I heard, and, and all the people around him heard, you know, not shouting, but there's the girl with big tits. I remember feeling at the time like I wanted to yell or scream or say something back, and I never did, because just a little bit more than that, I just wanted to be swallowed up. I just wanted it to end. As the ridicule continued, Beth's embarrassment built into anger. I think, I, I think some of it was I was angry at very specific people in high school. Looking back at the, you know, the sophomore, you know, I, I said for a long time, I said, if I, if I ever saw him, I just want to kill him. In this instance, Beth found a way to deal with her anger and get the harassment to stop. That Christmas in my high school, the student government would always like sell candy canes and, and little things, you know, and you can send cards. And I wrote one and I put two and, and wrote his name. And I just wrote on it, gentlemen hold their tongues. And I signed it with my full name and sent it to him. And he never said anything about it but he stopped making comments. And I don't think at the time he realized what he was doing in terms of hurting me. That was a way to be cool and get attention from the guys. Beth continued to grow after she graduated from high school and went off to college. Her parents said things would get better for her and there was less outright teasing. Physically though, she became more and more uncomfortable. I went swimming, but I had a really hard time buying swimsuits. I had a really hard time buying swimsuits. I wound up doing aerobics this last semester, but I wore two bras and a leotard and still hurt. I got a lot of back pain, um, a lot of jarring. Emotionally, she held back. I would have maybe gotten a little bit more physically involved with some boys, men, whatever, um, than I did because I was concerned about, you know, what's someone going to think of my body? And I, I think everyone has that to an extent. For me, it was very focused on, you know, I, I knew I was not in the normal scheme of things. But I began to realize as I was getting older, I started taking a look at things like and saying about this time, like, hey, I'm running from relationships with men um, and saying, you know, consciously or unconsciously and realizing that I had a problem with trust. Between her freshman and sophomore years of college, Beth decided that she wanted to have breast reduction surgery, but not right away. My older brother couldn't understand this. I, I told him, well, I'm thinking about waiting on the surgery, and he said, why? You said it was a problem when I talked to you last. Just get it done, and, you know, it, you're going to feel better. But Beth had a good reason for waiting. I wanted to heal my mind before I started changing my body. And I think that was one of the big things I had to go through, um, you know, was coming to, fact, coming to grips with the fact that what happened wasn't nice and it wasn't fun. And I wanted to deal with that first and then feel complete after the surgery rather than have the surgery and still not feel right and still have to go through the mental stuff. Beth found that a lot of the mental stuff wasn't easy to resolve. The feminist in me had a hard time with the surgery. You know, why should I be changing my body to suit the world's image? And, you know, there's nothing wrong with the way I look. And, and you know, why, why should we have to conform to this set image? But then I said, well, first of all, damn it, I've got to live in this world. Um, I'm not in an ivory tower. There are people out there who will look at me and meet me chest first. That's what I felt. There's nothing like having a conversation and realizing that they're talking to you about a foot below your face. It took a year for Beth to sort things out. By then, she knew what she wanted. I wasn't looking for, oh, you know, I just don't feel like I want to look better. 
was I want to be comfortable. It's like I want to feel normal. I want to be able to do things that I can't do. There's a big difference. Beth had her surgery four months ago, and today she's happy with the results. But she doesn't see the surgery as a cure-all. It didn't change any of her painful high school experiences, and the surgery itself left scars. Well, like I said, I don't have the perfect body. I have scars that will always be there, and I will have to explain to anyone I get intimate with. I feel like I am better able to do that. First of all, it's my choice. I chose to have the scars, and I was much more conscious. It's always nice when you have control. I didn't have control over that before. I didn't pick what I wanted to look like. Um, and for me, it's a, it's a worthwhile trade-off. Though her body isn't perfect, Beth says there's nothing she'd want to change about it. Well, almost nothing. I'd like to lose five pounds. I think every woman wants to have thinner thighs. So would I. But beyond that, not really. There are elements in the story of Beth that are common to many young women, and there are elements unique to her alone. What's common is the sequence of events at puberty, a sequence shaped in mysterious ways by the social needs of our distant ancestors, a sequence that has a different meaning now than it had back then. Though there are common elements in all stories of puberty, there are unique ones too. Some of us mature early, others late. And many individual experiences affect how we feel about our bodies and ourselves. All of us go through changes and all of us sense the reaction of others. But not all of us take the steps that Beth took. And not all of us keep things in her perspective. I didn't have a perfect body before and I don't, didn't have one after. I have a perfectly normal body. <laughs>